percent we have prevention barriers and for those of you who are familiar with later protection analysis typically these prevention barriers would be classed as independent protection layers um, on the flip side once we've lost control we've we've experienced the top event we don't necessarily directly or immediately suffer the consequences so we may have opportunities to reduce the severity or the the or recover the situation so we have mitigation barriers which um, are slowing or stopping the, the transition essentially these diagrams are read from left to right so our threats have to pass through prevention barriers to lead to the loss of control at the top event having lost control we have um, opportunities to reduce or recover that um, situation so we don't actually lead to the consequences so the bow tie gives us um, a really clear representation that's not um, bogged down with excessive text or numbers um, so we can really quickly um, see where we have defense in depth where we have multiple threats um, multiple barriers and multiple consequences and gets a, a sense of criticality and complexity of the situation um, that to be honest less technical people have to manage and monitor on a day-to-day -day basis um, one of the um, useful things in the ccps book is uh, a classification of barrier types and those barrier types pretty much fall into one of five categories you've either got passive hardware so typically that could be a dike or a blast wall so there's no action or reaction it's a static structure typically then you've got active hardware um, that could be um, instrumented or it could be mechanical so safety instrumented functions or relief valves and essentially they have this detect decide and do or detect decide at um, structure where you typically need um, two or three components in order to uh, perform the action then you've got barriers that involve humans so you've got the combination of um, hardware and humans so either the hardware is doing the sensing and the human is doing the action or the humans doing the sensing and the hardware is doing the action so that could be um, manual call points it could be alarms for example and then you've got active human where you're wholly relying on operator action or vigilance or response um, and lastly you've got continuous hardware it could be ventilation systems to um, avoid um, flammable atmospheres so unlike active they're not triggered they're running all the time um, and each barrier or barrier type has its strengths and weaknesses and those can be displayed on the diagram in a number of um, different ways so we can show the the barrier um, we can show barrier effectiveness let's just say this barrier is very good um, so we can show the um, effectiveness of the barrier we can also show the um, uh, criticality of the barrier whether it's high criticality low criticality um, there's a number of different um, attributes we can show so you're basically adding layers of information layers of knowledge around this structure um, so you can zoom in and zoom out um, share these with your um, colleagues or, or the people who are sustaining these barriers because these barriers are are your defense and it's really the the presence and the performance of the barriers that are giving you the asset integrity and at the heart of this is asset integrity as long as you're 
your assets are intact, as long as your um, hazards are controlled and contained, then you have a, a safe and productive process. So that, that's the basics. It's a visual technique. Read the diagram from left to right. It's an escalation from threat through prevention barriers to the point where you lose control. Having lost control, there may be mitigation barriers to reduce the impact before you actually um, experience or, or suffer the consequences or negative effects. Thanks, David. Well, I have a couple of questions just while people type their questions in. Um, so one of the things that comes up all the time when I am doing HAZOPS or when I'm talking to people is they say, well, we have a relief valve. There is no need for any further barriers, right? Because it is the ultimate protection. What, what, what will you say about any barrier uh, on the bow tie? Is there any sort of ultimate protection apart from inherently safer design? Nothing, nothing is perfect. Relief valves, um, whilst they, they typically have a lower probability of failure on demand than, than other devices, relief valves are not perfect. You have to remember that relief valves are sized for certain duties. They may be for fire case, they may be for uh, gas, uh, glass, gas blow by, they could be for thermal expansion. And you know, just because the valve lifts doesn't mean it's discharging um, the, the right amount. So you, you could have, and th this is the, the subtle difference between barriers operating and barriers performing it's the same as um, having a high level trip on a tank. Just because the, 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 the valve closes, it may not close in, in the right time. And if you look at the layer protection analysis book, the CCPS LOPA book, they've got the, these really simple uh, bullet points that, that protection layers, or read that as barriers, have to be big enough, fast enough, and strong enough. And if your relief valve isn't big enough because it's been wrongly sized or because the inlet or outlet is choked, then it's not going to give you the performance that it needs. Um, so these, the, there's nothing that's really fit and forget. They, they, they may have a low probability of failure, but if you've got a, a really um, uh, dirty process stream or an aggressive process stream, then and you're not looking after your relief valves, your relief valves are not going to look after you. Yeah, that's right. And then you mentioned before also the, that you can follow the inherently safer design approach when it comes to hazard, and it's very unlikely that we'll be able to eliminate our hazard. But we yeah. can also maybe apply that um, approach when we, we look at the threat lines to minimize the number of threat lines or with regards to the consequences, we may be able to eliminate some of the consequences depending on our location. Do you have some examples of where you've had seen some good practice with that in the workshops? I think if you, if you go back to the basics of, of the ERIC part of it, the eliminate, reduce, isolate. So if you can isolate, um, if you look at the right-hand side of the diagram, so if you've lost control, you've had a release of a flammable atmosphere, I, and, and your primary goal is to protect lives, then isolating people from the plant or the plant from the people is uh, a reasonably robust defense or, or, or um, protection measure, as long as you're, you're actually, you've got the discipline to control the access and you know who is where and when. So, you know, when you start to look at the, again, there's, there's a lot of overlap with um, layer protection analysis and looking at, you know, and vulnerability and things like that. Um, but, you know, if you could build your facility in the middle of a, of a desert or where there's hardly anybody there or an unmanned platform, then you've got, you're, you're certainly not going to harm anybody or you may harm them when they're doing routine visits or routine maintenance, you're pretty sure you're going to damage the asset 
um, and you're probably going to damage the environment. And I think that's one of the the useful um, outputs or outcomes from this technique. So when you're losing control of your hazard, you've got multiple consequences. You've got human consequences, you've got environmental consequences, you've got asset consequences, and all the um, the barriers, um, the, the mitigation barriers on the right-hand side will be completely different. Um, so for example, and, and again, this is very close to, to layer protection analysis. So um, limiting the occupancy or the exposure to the hazard is, um, a reasonable defense when it comes to protecting life, but it's not for protecting the environment, it's not for protecting mm. um, the asset. And I think that's the thing I really like about this representation is you get to see which barriers are effective against which consequences and take action there. We've had a question uh, from the room. So it is, can you add the frequency of each threat and consequence and the probability of failure on demand for the barriers on this tool. Yeah, so um, if you um, bear with me, um, for those of you of a certain generation, you'll remember Blue Peter, so he's one, here's one I prepared earlier. So um, I've, I've talked quite a lot about layer protection analysis and um, what this particular piece of software does, this is Bowtie XP, um, other uh, other tools are available, um, but what what the software allows you to do is um, you can create. Um, this is a, a layer protection analysis plugin, so I can put in um, a frequency here. Um, I can put in a probability here. Oops. And putting a probability here. And then if I show that. So if I set myself a target Frequency, let me see, 10 to the minus 5. So now, now this is telling me that if I got a, a threat or initiating event happening once every 10 years, my prevention barrier has a probability of failure of 0.3. Um, my mitigation barrier has a probability of 0.5. So my frequency times my probability times my probability gives me a frequency, 1.5 times 10 to the minus two. I've got a target of 10 to the minus five. So the reality is I'm not, um, I'm not going to meet my um, target frequency. If I change that to be uh, 10 to the minus 3 or something, and change that. So I, I, can, I, can, I can do numerical analysis on my scenario, but you have to remember two things. Firstly, you've got to have a robust scenario. So there's no point putting good numbers on a bad diagram. Secondly, putting bad numbers on a good diagram is just as useless. So um, the the CCPS book, um, does, CCPS LOPA book does have some typical um, initiating event frequencies and has some typical probabilities of failure. And you can actually build that into your um, analysis. So here, I've got all the, uh, from the CCPS book um, here. Uh, so pipe leak, this is the frequency of a, a pipe leak, 10% section for 100 meters. 
um, I can I can use that in the calculation. Similarly, um, my um, uh, probabilities. So you can build this into the tool. So everybody's using the same probabilities, the same frequencies um, to do the analysis. But ultimately, the best analysis comes from the the, the performance of your own facilities. Um, but at least this is a starting point. Um, to to drive an element of consistency. So hopefully that answered the question. That um, does. And then the, you mentioned in the introduction that it's very easy to draw a bad bow tie. And I've seen some bad ones in the past. But if you can just give us some quick things that, you know, we can look at a bow tie and go, oh, yeah, no, that one's a bad one or that one's a good one. Are there some things that we could have a quick look at when we when we open our bow tie to see whether we're on a good a good foundation or not so um uh, typically um there's as i said before with the active um hardware barriers where you've got this detect decide do structure so let's just say you've got a safety instrumented function um so you've got a sensor a logic solve and a final element you need all those three components to make the function function. Now, um, if you represent that as three separate barriers, that's giving you a false sense of security because if you're losing the sensor, the logic solver is blind um, and, the, and the, uh, the final element can't act. So that's a sort of um, classic, um, mistake to believe you've got this diverse defense in depth when you've actually got a, a whole lot of common cause issues. Um, so that, that's an obvious one. Um, in terms of the the threat um, breakdown, um, it's, it's not really appropriate to include a barrier failure as a threat. Um, and you know, going back to the uh, the previous diagram, um, there's that this guidance comes out of the CCPS book. So three things: the the threat's got to lead to the top event. It's got to have basically the the, the means or the drive to get there, but not to be um, failure of a barrier. Similarly, um, on the consequence side of things, um, it's it's easy to think that the it's easy to get the, the top event and the consequence mixed up. So um, you know you, you may put a fire as the um, top event, but in order to have the fire, you've had to have loss of containment of your flammable fluid, and you've had to have an ignition source. So there's an opportunity there to control the ignition source as a barrier. So, um, like I say, it, it's, it, it's not good practice to, to mix and match your consequences and, and, and your top events. And again, um, I'm not trying to, to sell this in any way, but the, um, the CCPS book has some really good guidance here as to what makes a good hazard, what makes a good top event, what makes a good consequence, what makes a bad consequence. Um, so I encourage people, it's, I don't know, $100, something like that. Um, it's, it's not going, it's like any, any publication, it's like, you know, the, the, if any of you have read the HAZOP standard 61882, it won't make you a good HAZOP facilitator it's a starting point and it's, it's, it gives you a sense of consistency, how to, um, how to avoid the pitfalls. But the, the book is a really useful reference and it, it's really practical. Um, like I say, there's, there's tables in there. What's a good, a good threat, a good barrier. Um, um, I mean, a common thing I've seen is that, um, they put a separate barrier for the maintenance of the safety critical elements. 
Yeah, and I mean, that, say, that... you know, it has to be working to be effective. And so the maintenance is not independent. And then they put another one for the design of that particular equipment. So the design, yeah. the operation and the maintenance are all separate out into three barriers. Again, giving you a sort of false sense of security. Yeah, I mean, that 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 is a, a really good example of, and again, um, if you look at the, the CCPS LOPA book, which is like nearly 20 years old now, it, it's got a really useful table about what's an IPL, what's an independent protection layer and what is not. And training is not an IPL, maintenance is not an IPL. What these, and, and the, the, the bow tie book explains us really well. And what it explains it as, is that these are, this software calls escalation factor, but you know the, the book calls it a degradation factor. Um, if I could spell it. Um, and for those of you that are familiar with the Swiss cheese model, what your degradation factors are, are basically, these are threats to the barriers. These are what's creating or enlarging the holes in your Swiss cheese slices. Um, so they're allowing, they're weakening that barrier and allowing that transition or that trajectory from threat to top event and top event to consequence. Now, to, 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 to stop the, the degradation of the barriers, you have, um, you have these degradation controls and that's where the maintenance, the competence comes in they are sustaining the, the, yeah yeah because procedures are just a piece of paper procedures are not making things safe they may underpin it um but you know you know whether it's it's um fatigue management or competence management or document management these these are underpinning the the presence and the performance of the barriers to make sure that they are doing what you what they are intended to do you're giving them the best opportunity to to be there and do the right thing as this um and this is where i believe that the term escalation came from these um these factors are allowing the escalation from threat to top event and top event to consequence um so it's they're allowing that related. that to to to, yes. to snowball I have another question from um, the audience. It yeah. is um, CCPS guide is a good starting point. Are there any guides, other guides that you follow um, for other viewpoints? Um, there's a Norwegian. Um, oh man, I forgot the, the 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 number of it. There's an uh, I I can I can dig it out and we can put it in the video or something. There's a Norwegian offshore uh, petroleum standard. Um, is that the... Is, is, you, yeah, what's it? is that the, the NORSOC process safety one? It's, it's number 12. But anyway, that, yeah, it's easy to they, find on the site. Yeah, they're, there's, they're, they've got um, a similar taxonomy, shall we say, of, of barrier types. Um, but they're, they're, they're pretty much, um, it's the same idea that you've got at the, what, what's, what's um, you know, keeping you safe is the, the presence and performance of these hardware and human um, measures, these organizational and technical measures that are kept um, available, are, are kept um, operable by your management systems. So if, if you're um, familiar with the Energy Institute or the CCPS or, or other process safety management structures, 20 elements, 14 elements, all of these are underpinning your um, protection portfolio. They, they're um, making sure that um, you, your 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 barriers are in place. They stay in place, and and like I said, are they big enough, fast enough, and strong enough? Um, and I I think as well what the the bow tie does um, is it, it also 
gives you a really good platform for management of change to do that impact assessment. If I delete this barrier, what am I sacrificing? Now, in this diagram, it's pretty obvious what you're sacrificing, but when you start to build up your scenarios and you've got multiple, um, um, let me just do something real quick. You've got multiple um, um, scenarios and multiple barriers. So here in, in this software, Bowtie XP, the fact that this, this is telling me this barrier is a group. So I've actually deployed this barrier twice. If I was to um, start to use that, that barrier in multiple locations, the, the, the software makes it more prominent what I'm actually jeopardizing by defeating or degrading it, um, if, if that makes sense. So you've got that, that, um, that clarity. And, and it's the same with um, temporary changes. So frigs or overrides or things like that, you, you've got an immediate sense of what am I, what am I doing? What am I changing? Um, what am I weakening? Um, because I've got this, this real sense of context. Where does that particular barrier fit into my overall um, strategy? So I have another question from um, the group. Is Can we go through an example? So I suppose what I could do is if I give you um, a threat line, Maybe we can just give a representation of how that might um, look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, our threat is um, uh, it's we're, we're going to be, the thing that we're going to do is we're going to overfull our tank. And um, it's flammable liquid, a bit like Bunsfield. Um, we are starting to fill our tank when it's already overfill. So we are putting in too much. Um, you know, the, the tanker is filling to the wrong tank. Okay. So then um, maybe we could say one of our, um, one of our barriers would be, so there's the operating procedure for the connection to the correct fill line. So making sure that we connect to the right tank. I'm just trying to tidy this up. Um, yes, yeah, It's just because you, you can, if I can just show you real quick, look, there's, there's a whole raft of data you can show in your diagram, and I'm just trying to focus in on what bits you want to, what bits you want to see. Okay, and then the second one is we have a, high level alarm on the on the tank which would alert us to the tank uh, becoming overfill with an operator response associated with that um and then the third one is we do have an independent uh trip function uh which will shut off all inlets to that tank So regardless of whether the alarm's gone off or not, when that trip function's activated, all inlet valves to that tank will close and anything that's feeding that tank will be deadheaded uh, so that we can't get any more in. And so, Oops. yeah. Um, so what I was gonna show you is, um, one of the features is you can you can have like a, essentially a barrier name and then some barrier description. So you, you can put in a whole lot of detail underneath um, and show or hide that level of detail. So if you want to um, just have a really neat diagram, you just have threat name, barrier name, etc. But if you want to say you've got to demonstrate to regulator, you, you can add much more detail into it. Um, yeah, we used to add all our, our tag numbers in there 
um, yeah. so that it was uh, really good. You know, yeah. like really good representation of what yeah. was going on. Yeah. Um, and then, so then this loss of containment, it's generally an unmanned area. So we're going to focus on the environmental consequences um, and the asset consequences. So the first one is that uh, we are relatively close to environmentally sensitive area and we have the potential to um, have loss of containment into the river polluting downstream system. So, um, Should say there's a spell check in this. I'm just um, just my fat fingers. Um, and then with regards to acid damage, there is um, a series of ten tanks in the one bund. And so, if we had a um, loss of containment, we would we would result in the the loss of ten tanks in this one bund. Okay, and so that some of the barriers we have, uh, we do have ignition control within the bund. So everything is designed, uh, so it'll be the second one, I think, not the first one. Yeah, um, so that's within the bund. We have, um, with regards to the environment, we have got a bund which is sized for 1.1 times the volume of a tank. Uh, which is sufficient to prevent um, overspill to the, the river. It's also lined, which obviously is part of that, that one barrier. It's not independent. So it's not going to allow leaching. Okay, so, and then I'll just, we'll, that's just kind of a simplified representation. Um, but I wanted to just go through sort of one of the escalation factors we might have. So um, we know from our recent inspection that our high level alarm is non-operational. So um, our recent inspection has shown that um, the, the, there's obsolescence issues with regards to the alarm. And so we are unable to replace the parts that we need. Um, so it's non-operational. And unfortunately we haven't been able to identify any mitigating uh, measures. We are sending the operator around once a shift to go and check the, the sight glass, but um, that's really not, um, not, not very effective. Yeah, yeah, it's not, I mean, we can list it as a barrier, but we would say that it is not, a, not effective um, with regards to preventing the overfill. Okay, so some of, uh, we've had another question. I think that's kind of a good sort of scenario to answer the following questions is, um, can you show some light on all the process safety act aspects for a flammable tank? So we've, we've kind of covered quite a few of them here. We've got the ignition control, we've got the bund, we've got um, some operating procedures, et cetera. Um, it depends on what what standard your tank is is um, constructed to. What other what other things you may have on here? There may be other things associated with um, lightning rods, etc. So, but it all depends on um, on what standard your tank is and what your environment is. This is just a simplified example. I, I've also done an example for um, the Safety and Reliability Society. If you log on to their website, you'll be able to see that um, that there as well. I think that's an important point to to mention here is ignition sources 
come in various forms. So whether it's lightning, whether it's static, whether it's it's uh, hot work, you know, and and you can you can um, you you could break this down into the different um, ignition sources and how you are managing them. So there, there's there's opportunities to again provide this this um, layers of knowledge or layers of information that you can you can show and hide. Um, so that's that's really useful. If I can just show something really quick, just to help. Um, so if I uh, look at my barrier types, so if I say operating procedures is active human, for example, this might help give you some context. Um, hardware and human is alarm. Um, that's active hardware. Um, let's just say that's continuous and that's that's passive. And then as as Louise was saying, you can start to to apply um, effectiveness. So you could say, well, a lot of the operating procedures aren't, aren't very effective, so you can make that very poor. Um, and you can do all sorts of things. You can change the colors of, of the barriers to represent the effectiveness, the criticality, etc. You can start to show um, relative frequencies, um, you know, six, for example, every six months we experience uh, wrong filling. Um, so you can have a, a, a qualitative view of my my likelihood, my probabilities of failure, because this is a very poor effectiveness, so that's a high probability of failure. And then down to damage the environment, you know, what's my what's my sort of scale? Is it a major concern? You know, you, you can you can start to to do this. And and these are things that you would normally do in, in a risk register or or something like that. So it's the same information, it's just prevent presented in a um, in a much clearer um, format. Yeah, it's much easier to um answer questions when using the bow tie than right, trying to explain tables of loads and loads of text. I've got another on a question here. Is it possible to use the bow tie to analyze domino effect scenarios? So I think David, you answered this before because with the bow ties, when you use a, when you use a barrier several times, they're all linked. And so if you identify a weakness with that barrier, it demonstrates the weakness throughout the whole system. It, it does. I mean, I, I guess that's that's an element of of common cause failure. I think specifically, um, I think a real quick. Um, I'm just going to put some stuff in here. Um, that'll do that. Uh, So in terms of domino effects, let, let's just say I've got a gas pipeline um, and that gas pipeline um, is adjacent to a tank farm. So um, if, I, if I lose containment or control of my flammable gas, um, I, I could actually... Um, create a, um, a jet fire, for example, that would lead to uh, an impact on the um, tank farm. So this, this is really messy, but basically the consequence from your gas pipeline loss of containment becomes a threat to your tank farm. So your, your jet fire is actually weakening the integrity of your oil tanks. Um, so that, that's an example of, of the domino effect where you've got a, an adjacent loss of containment, which is weakening your, um, uh, your sort of primary containment. So and then I suppose what we could do is from this, we would be able to then identify if there were 
there were common modes between the causes of the first one and the sort of mitigation of the second one, you know, which could have caught, I mean, I don't know if you've, if you've had, if the cause of the first one was poor maintenance associated with um, wall thickness checking, if the same person is doing the wall thickness checking to make sure the integrity of the tanks is good, then you maybe have a common cause. If uh, uh, absolutely. And, and, and you know, that, that's, that's a really key point here. So if one of the things, and, and this is very much based around the barrier, the barrier is, is the, is the key element here. So what you can do in here is you can assign accountabilities to um, barriers. So say for example, um, well that, that's the wrong that's the wrong person. That should be operations. But you you can assign um, um, do that real quick. Um, So you, you can, by assigning um, ownership or accountability to the, um, basically the, the, the protection measures, as Louise was saying, if your maintenance person goes off sick or um, becomes, I'm trying not to say incompetent, but less proficient because their training's expired or because you've outsourced it to another organization, that's a common cause vulnerability. And uh, one of the, the neat things you can do with the software is you can, um, you can find out where these um, common causes are. So I go to job title. So sh this is basically, it, it's easy in this diagram, but if I've got lots of diagrams or I've got a big diagram, um, so now this has collapsed the diagram down only to focus on the barriers where the um, maintenance are responsible. And I can, I can zoom in and zoom out to basically see um, where um, I've got these vulnerabilities. And if, if for example, um, let me do this real quick. If, for example, maintenance was the only the only barrier, then I'm going to be in trouble because I, I've now lost that that I've now got a threat that goes straight into my top event. So as soon as that happens, once every six months on average, I'm going to get a lost containment. I've nothing else to to slow or stop that escalation. You can then start to drill in that that might be the cause of the wrong tank filling because you might be having um you know that you know whatever is maybe the operating operators are not aware of the liquid level because the transmitter is not working and so therefore they are routinely filling to the wrong tank because they don't know that the tank has got liquid in it um so again you can do a reverse cycle, you know, like a reverse analysis as yeah, well. Yeah. Whether and any think, of these weakened barriers are contributing to your yeah. increased cause. Yeah. And the, the, the software, um, again, you, you're not really seeing the best of it here because it's quite a simple diagram. But what this register does is it says, so you can sort it by, so for example, here, this high level switch has been used twice. Now, if I if I built up my portfolio of scenarios and that that high level switch was used twenty times, for example, then I'm putting an awful lot of faith and reliance on that one device. Mm. And I think that's that's something that that we talked about earlier on. Two things: one is bad diagrams, and the other, is, as Louise said, is is giving your barriers an identity, giving it a tag. So if I didn't say that was LHC, LSH123, if I just said high, high level trip, that could be one of 20 high level trips. Yeah. And this is, this is something that um, you need to be mindful of, whether it's a bow tie or it's a HAZOP, you know, you've got to be specific about what your safeguards are. Don't just put high level alarm because that could be any high level alarm. That's right. 
Yeah, and that's a, a mistake I often see. And then it becomes very difficult to unravel once you've done the workshop. I have another question, which I think we answered before. Um, do we use LOPA to rate the barriers or what methodology do we use? So you mentioned before that um, the tool has a LOPA built in, but typically when you're examining these types of complex systems, I would recommend LOPA to be used um, to really evaluate, number one, you, you know, although you might be asking your questions whether these are effective, independent, auditable, and maintainable, um, you know, when you go through your LOPA, you have to actually ask those questions before you can take any credit. So that's a reason to use LOPA here. Uh, it, David, would you agree that LOPA would be used then to analyze these types of systems? I, I, I agree this is a really good platform for conducting and communicating LOPA, but um, you know, there, there's, I think it comes down to proportionality. And I know that a lot of companies, particularly when they're, they're doing functional safety work, the um, maybe more European countries than North American, but a lot of companies will have like a staged approach where they'll do like, um, I don't know whether Louise has touched on this before, but whether you've got like a risk graph approach so you'll have a risk graph, which is essentially a screening. And if the risk graph suggests it should be cell two or cell three, then you'll go into LOPA. So you you may find that you've got potentially 100 safety instrumented functions. You may not want to do 100 LOPAs, but by using a screening technique, whether it's a matrix or risk graph, you can trim that down to be 20 cell twos and cell threes and then do LOPA on those 20 that's that's a sort of um cultural approach or depends on on, on you know the um the engineering principles of, of the the company but um you know louise is right you're going to ask yourself the same questions whether it's it's a qualitative or a quantitative approach um fundamentally these need to be underpinned by you know good data and good evidence um, because if, if everybody just used the same values out of the CCPS book um, it's um, we're all going to be surprised because our control systems don't fail once every 10 years or you know our relief valves don't fail one in a hundred um, it's very it's easy to fall back in these numbers but these numbers actually mean something yeah yeah um, but also, when you, if you're going more conservative than the book, just e exercise extreme caution. You know, uh, don't. Yeah, I, I, don't. absolutely. And I, I think you know, there's there's lots of publications out there. If you're if you're in an offshore environment, then you're perhaps used to a reader. But bear in mind, a reader is built up over years and years of salty marine performance. And if you're on a squeaky clean pharmaceutical site in the home counties, you, you're not going to get that level of aggression. So, uh, you know, you, you, have to, you have to be um, uh, wise enough to, to, to bring some context to these numbers. And you may find that your failure rates are actually worse because you've got old equipment that's difficult to maintain, there's... Louise said there's maybe obsolescence issues and you can't find the spare parts. So um, by all means, use use books to get a starting point. But certainly the regulators want to know that you've actually taken these things seriously and, and got more appropriate and relevant and statistically significant data. Yeah, and re just really thought about it. Yeah. Um, I've got a question about putting procedure as a barrier. So as we've mentioned in the discussion, you may have a procedure as a barrier. As we mentioned here, there's a, there is a, a perfectly credible scenario. We have a procedure to fill the correct tank. Um, it relies on a level gauge, which is independent of our high level alarm and independent of our level switch. So, you know, that may be a perfectly credible um, barrier. But as David has said here, it may not be very effective. So it's really about understanding the effectiveness of your barriers, which ones are going to fail more frequently, and how much weight you put on them. What I would say is if you're building any bow tie, if you have more than one operational uh, barrier, 
you're in trouble. Um, and that's probably because you've got the same operators doing uh, both tasks. And so therefore they're not independent. Um, so really when you put in operational uh, barriers, make sure you think about each one, making sure they're independent, completely independent, i.e. different people do them. Um, they're written in different documents, et cetera, completely independent. And um, in general, I wouldn't see to operating procedures unless there was a very specific reason, like you needed to operate something what, before you were executing an engineering change. I think David, is there anything you want to add there? Well, I, I, I know I sound like a stuck record, but I really encourage um, everybody to have a look at this CCPS bow tie book because there's a whole chapter dedicated to human factors or human organizational factors. And that there's there's two schools of thought that the, that the book covers as to whether you should you should treat whether you should be thinking of humans creating threats or humans being barriers. And and there's some really good discussions in the book. Um, as long as as long as you stick to to the to whichever approach makes sense to you. And I think different different organisations or different cultures. If you've come from a, a facilities which have a lot of automation um, versus ones that are more manually interactive, then you've maybe got a different approach. But um, like I said, right at the start, you can really quickly create diagrams in the software. The, 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 the software is, is, not where they, is not the clever part. The clever part is your experience and, and your knowledge because these are, you're, you're using this as a platform to, to collate and communicate knowledge and um, the, the diagrams um, are essentially a, a foundation for your asset management or your, your barrier management. Um, uh, you know, so um, they, have to, they have to make technical sense, they have to make, make operational sense. Um, so yeah, it's it's um, it's easy to draw it, but to, to draw one um, that 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 meets the objectives, and and you may find that your your diagrams have different objectives. It may be to um, to communicate complex scenarios. Um, it may be to for a, a safety case or a safety report where you've got to demonstrate to the regulator that you understand your hazards and you're in, in control so it may be um, a lot more um, complicated different levels of detail um, and again the book goes into different different ways of using it so that the, the diagrams the the boxes the barriers the circles dead easy but to actually get um, you know, an effective one takes takes some practice and some experience, but please don't be put off by it. Um, it's it's there to to basically represent your knowledge. So we have additional two questions, which I don't think we're going to have time for tonight, unless you want to stay on for another five minutes. The first one is: um, Have you carried out exercises considering? how to limit the loss of system function. So if I answer from my experience, yes, a lot of the time we, um, when creating these uh, diagrams, we're trying to, especially on the mitigative side, think about how we can limit this um, environmental damage or the asset damage. So how can we stop getting to that point? Um, and as well with regards to the threats, Sometimes there's a way of um, minimizing the threat such that it cannot result in the loss of containment. So again, just challenging yourself when you create the drawing really does help you embed that inherently safer design approach. And that's why I like the bow tie because it, it gives you that option of speaking about it in a very visual way. Is there anything you want to add there, David? No, I, th I think, um, you know, just, uh, just, if I look at the heart of this, if we, if we talk about Bunsfield, you know, you had an overfill of a tank, which everybody remembers. But when you start to, to look to the left of the diagram, there's, 
there's many ways you can lose containment. You can overfill it, you can collapse it, you can corrode it, you can drive a vehicle into it. And by, ha by having that open-minded th thought, you don't blinker yourself and think about, well, all I'm worried about is overfilling the tank. Um, mm. And, and that, that's the, the, the reality of it, is you're pulling together that knowledge, that information, um, because overfilling might happen once in a blue moon, whereas, you know, uh, vehicle impact or external corrosion or other things may actually be the more dominant threat. And the software allows you to do that, you know, whether you, you, can, you can change colors and put text of what's, what's the most dominant threat. And then our, our, um, our last question is um, experience on how we use the bow tie tool to communicate the risk from top management to the frontline worker. So I have previously used the bow tie tool to communicate with uh, senior management. It gave me a way of representing how reliant we were on operating um, procedures for a particular facility. So it, it helped me demonstrate to them why the operators were much more important in this uh, facility than they would have been in, say, other facilities where we would have had more engineered controls. So that was a way of discussing with them. And also it, it gave them an understanding, it, because it's so visual, it gives them a very quick understanding of the, um, the main uh, major accident hazards on the facility and what we're doing to manage them. When I was talking to the front line, the way I used it was we did this accountability um, that David has mentioned here and um, made sure that I communicated to each party what they were actually accountable for, what it meant for them. What did this bow tie mean for them? And that was a way of generating ownership within the asset. And that worked really well as well. David, do you have any other experience you wanna share on the communication part? No, I, th I think I think like you said, uh, it's. I mean, I, 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 you can see this on the screen. This is basically just a breakdown of um, a, a list of of barriers that that an individual or a role is is responsible for. But I think to you know the the real power comes from the the, the visual side of things. And and like I said, you can you can really quickly collapse down your diagram. Um, to, to home in on the key message, you know, you can, and, and there's there's a lot of clever things you can do. You can you can hook this into your maintenance management system so you could actually make these barriers go red or green live. Um, you know, so from the from the the boardroom looking down, they they maybe just need to know well we've got um, two green barriers and a red barrier here. We've got an orange barrier there. Um, that, that gives us some concern. So, you know, you, you don't even, you, you can you can zoom out, you don't even need to see the text, all you need to know is the, the sort of traffic light system from it. Um, yeah, I would say that the one thing that I found with the bow ties is it didn't represent the sort of underlying um, competencies. For example, leadership, is a foundation for the whole system working really well. Um, but when you're looking at specific barriers, et cetera, that's not really coming through as a message um, on the bow tie because the leadership team are not uh, responsible for turning valve X, Y, Z or for maintaining whatever. They're, they're not, it's not their responsibility. Um, however, that is kind of, we need to just remember that that is the foundation for this. And without that strong foundation, all of these things can fall apart anyway. Um, so, but that's something that you can fall into a trap if you're just looking at the bow ties. You can forget that there are other supporting, supporting um, structures yeah, around. Yeah, and, and, and culture is the same. It's, it's difficult to measure mm -hmm. leadership and culture, but they, they are two key you know, pillars in process safety management. Okay. Um, I am going to just thank you very much, David. Really appreciate your time today. Oh, you're um, next week, we've got Nick Howard.
who is going to be coming to talk to us about functional safety, getting a good grip on functional safety. So we will cover some of the things we've covered today, but it's going to be a much more in-depth discussion about functional safety. And uh, you can come and ask any questions you have about functional safety. So thank you everyone who's attended today. Thank you, David, again for your time. You, and I hope you all had a productive session. Thank you. Thank you.